Howdy y'all, welcome to Poop Tip Tuesday, where every Tuesday I answer questions you guys have given to me and hopefully give you the information you need to break down the barriers and the confusing misinformation that's out there. Howdy y'all, Dr. Islam here, aka Poop Guru and Gut Microbiome Expert. My passion is to give you, yes you, the best tips and tricks so you can live your best life from the top all the way down to the bottom. If you haven't already, don't forget to smash that like button, like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and newsletter. Come see us a little bit gastro for all your GI needs. We have a great show today. We have three main topics we're going to review in today's video and in today's show. We'll discuss milk and magnesia and why it causes abdominal pain. We'll discuss how eating more vegetables can change your bowel habits. And we'll do a deep dive on what's called fatty liver disease. If you want your questions answered, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Send me a message, send me a DM, and subscribe to my newsletter as well. All right. Let's begin. Hey, Dr. Islam, I take milk and magnesia, but I notice I have a lot of gas and pain. What is going on? So milk and magnesia is very commonly used as a laxative to help out when it comes to constipation. It's effective and it works. And I recommend this for a lot of my patients when they're having constipation as a predominant symptom. But you can have a lot of side effects from taking this particular medication as well. So keep in mind, milk and magnesia does work as a laxative. It actually brings water into the colon to help flush everything out to allow you to have a better bowel movement. And that increased water content can get you feeling bloated and cause you to have a lot of that discomfort you may be feeling when you take milk and magnesia. Number two is that it can also change the pH of your gut microbiome. Your gut microbiome and your GI tract has a very narrow pH where it needs to be in to do its most effective job to allow you to Hopefully live your life and not have to worry about what's going on inside your GI tract. The introduction of magnesium hydroxide can alter that pH balance, which can change your GI tract and your gut microbiome as well. And by changing that pH balance, you can also alter the effect on your GI tract to cause bloating and pain to occur. And then lastly, some people are individually sensitive to milk and magnesium, and that's perfectly fine. If you tend to be sensitive to that particular medication or the ingredients in that, it's okay to not take that and to realize that that may be a reason why you're having some of your issues and may want to try something else to give you that laxative effect. But these are some of the reasons why milk and magnesia, even though it's an effective medication for constipation, can cause a lot of bloating, distension, and pain to occur. Great question. All right, topic number two. Hey, Dr. Islam, does eating more vegetables affect your bowel habits? Heck yeah, it does, and that's our goal. So vegetables are the backbone for a fibrous diet. You guys know me, I am pro vegetables. Go vegetables, go veggies, go veggies. And absolutely, it will change your bowel habits. You're adding more fiber into your diet. You're adding more minerals, more vitamins, a lot more just benefits for your GI tract, and it's going to change to make things better for you. Now, some people are a little more sensitive to certain foods and certain vegetables, and that's okay. We know there are a subset of foods called the FODMAPs, which are known to produce a lot of gas. Get gas with broccoli, that is because it's a FODMAP. Get gas with Brussels sprouts like me, that is a FODMAP. And some people tend to be a little bit more sensitive to that. But excluding that particular group, absolutely having vegetables is going to change your bowel habits. And that's what we want to improve your bowel habits and to change your gut microbiome. So what are my tips to hopefully make that adjustment a little bit easier? So what I recommend for anyone adding fiber is to go low and go slow. That is my impression of going slow. You don't want to change everything all at once. It's too much of a shock to your GI tract. So take your time. Do it over a couple of weeks to slowly introduce more fiber into your diet. Number two, have a right balance of both soluble and insoluble fiber. Vegetables tend to have both. Different vegetables have different fibers that are in there. So kind of play around and see what's gonna be the best thing for you. And number three, Give yourself patience and grace. It's okay if your GI tract doesn't want to react or to change right then and there. Don't be impatient when it comes to that. Make the changes slowly over time to get you feeling better and to get you back on track. All right guys, topic number three, fatty liver disease. What is it, what is going on, and what can we do to get this taken care of for you? So fatty liver disease is under the spectrum of just fat that accumulates in the liver. Now there are two main reasons why people have fat. One is alcohol, which we'll exclude in today's video, but we know that alcohol is a direct toxin to your liver 
and can produce fat in the liver as well. And we know that alcohol can destroy your liver, but that is called alcoholic liver disease, even though it can be seen as fat. We're going to focus on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. This is now, unfortunately, the most common cause of liver failure and liver cirrhosis in the United States. That's crazy. It surpasses hepatitis C, alcohol, and other causes for people to have their liver to fail. So let's do a deep dive into fatty liver disease. So what exactly causes fatty liver disease? We know the main cause, you guys know this, is fat around the belly. Diet and lack of exercise is literally the biggest killer of people and Americans in the US and worldwide as well. And we know that obesity leads to so many complications, reflux, diarrhea, liver failure, cirrhosis, but other cancers as well, and high blood pressure and heart disease. And it can certainly can affect the liver. So what are the main symptoms of fatty liver disease? And this is the scary thing is that fatty liver disease does not cause symptoms until it's too late. And that is so scary for a lot of my patients because a lot of my patients don't realize that the liver is damaged or something's going on until they actually have cirrhosis. And that's when it's typically too late. So what our goal is as GI doctors and liver doctors is to find fatty liver disease before it becomes something bad, treat it and get that taken care of you. So how do we diagnose this? Well, your doctor has to have a high clinical suspicion that you may have fatty liver disease. So for example, if you have high blood pressure, if you have obesity, if you have diabetes or pre-diabetic, these are risk factors for developing fatty liver disease. And in that setting, we recommend getting blood testing for your liver and maybe getting imaging like an ultrasound of your liver as well. The combination of these two tests will give us a better idea if you have fatty liver disease or not. And based on that, we can determine what the next steps are. So what's important for me as a liver specialist is not necessarily to have fat on your ultrasound or high liver numbers, but is that causing damage? That is the holy grail when it comes to fatty liver disease because you can have fat in your liver for a long time, but if it's not causing damage, I don't give a flip, it doesn't matter. But you can have a little bit of fat, but if it's actually causing damage or fibrosis, that's what we need to know. There are three main ways we can determine are you having fibrosis. So number one is that we can do some simple calculations based on blood tests to see what your fibrosis score is, and we use that to predict how much inflammation is going on in your liver. Number two is that we can do special imaging tests to see exactly how much scarring is in that liver. These are not like a typical ultrasound. It's a special imaging test that we can order to see if that's the case. Then lastly, the gold standard is to do a liver biopsy. We actually put a needle in your liver, look at it under a microscope, see how much scarring that's there to determine the risk of fibrosis. Now, we cannot possibly do a liver biopsy on everyone even though it's a gold standard. So typically we try to aim for either blood testing and or imaging testing to give us a better score of what is going on in your liver. Now, if your score is low, we typically don't have to do a lot. Maybe dietary options, lifestyle options, hope to hopefully get you back on track. But if you have damage, if you have fibrosis, or you're looking like you're going to lead to liver failure, we need to intervene. And the best thing, the most effective thing you can do is diet and lifestyle and weight loss. These have been shown in so many clinical trials to help out with your fatty liver. More important than supplements, which I'll talk about, more important than anything else is losing weight. And the best way you can lose weight is to minimize carbs and to go on a Mediterranean type diet. It works, it's effective, and can help out with your GI issues and liver issues as well. But I like to go into specifics because I know it's hard sometimes for me to give you a general recommendation of what we can do. So here are the specific things that I recommend for my patients. Number one, there are certain foods I need you to eliminate or get rid of. These include pizza, pasta, bread, cookies, tortillas here in the south, carbonated drinks, and alcohol like I mentioned before. These we know will trigger fatty liver disease and these are things that we know can cause more fat to accumulate in the liver. Number two, I need you to exercise, even a little bit of exercise, 10 or 15 minutes per day. Even if you don't lose weight has been shown in clinical trials, to decrease your risk of developing liver disease, liver failure, and liver cirrhosis. And sometimes you may need help with that, whether it's taking weight loss medications, maybe even something as radical as weight loss surgery. If you need it, don't be ashamed to do that. This will take care of about 85 to 90% of your fatty liver disease. There are certain supplements that you can do to help out. 
Number one, in certain individuals, vitamin E has been shown to help out when it comes to fatty liver disease. The important thing about vitamin E is that you need to speak to your doctor about this because there are some people in which it increases your risk of developing prostate cancer. So don't take vitamin E without speaking to your doctor. Number two, black coffee has been shown in clinical trials to help out with fatty liver disease. Now keep in mind, this is not coffee. With all the yummies, all the good stuff, all the cream, all the sugar, all the milk, no, 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 it's black coffee, two to four cups per day has been shown to help out when it comes to fatty liver disease. It can be decaf or caffeine, doesn't matter. What you should not do 100%, which we all agree upon, is take a liver detox. Oh my goodness, it doesn't work. It can kill you. In fact, I've had to send a lot of patients to get a liver transplant because they took a liver detox. Do not do that. It doesn't work. They're trying to steal your money and make you do something that's gonna be harmful for your liver. But this is exactly what you need to do to make sure you don't have any liver disease. So here are the talking points you need to remember. Number one, if you have a risk factors for developing fatty liver disease, get your liver checked out to make sure it's doing okay. Number two, diet and lifestyle will fix 85% of what's going on in your liver. And then lastly, do not take a liver cleanse or liver detox to get your liver taken care of. It doesn't work, it's gonna make things worse for you. All right guys, I thank you for watching. If you haven't already, don't forget to smash that like button, like, share, and subscribe. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and newsletter. And don't forget to join me on future Poop Tip Tuesdays. So thank you for watching. Guys, let's talk about poop. Thanks everyone.